Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where it's already the end of April, and I cannot believe how fast time is going right now. But that means it's time for another quick news roundup of what's going on on the Azure Databricks platform. So I started this off last month, and we had a look at everything that happened inside of March, and now we can have a look at everything that's happened inside of April. And there's a few changes we've gotten in. Uh, a lot of the changes, obviously, we've seen already in that Databricks runtime 8.2. But there's a few things going on on the platform that you should be aware of, especially if you're doing some networking. So we'll have a look at those changes. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know down below if there's anything we should cover, if there's anything you want to know, any of these things that you think we haven't done justice to, get in touch. Otherwise, let's have a look. Okay, right. So I've got the platform release notes. I am on the Azure version here, so there are different release notes for GCP and AWS, but they're largely the same. Um, the interesting one is looking at the platform one, because that tends to be where we have some slight differences between the implementation. So what do we have in our list? So number one, ooh, zoom right in. Uh, number one, we've got the Databricks runtime 8.2. So we spoke about that. That is really, really cool. And it's got two major things that I really care about. It's got the one which is to do with the schema drift with autoloader. So if you're pulling data in, especially if it's in JSON or delimited text format using autoloader, you can have it infer the schema from the most recent file whenever it restarts, and you can have it keep its own track of what it thinks the schema is, and then evolve that and merge it and keep track of it, or dump everything that doesn't fit into a, essentially a dumpster diving column of doom called the rescue column. And that is really cool. Loads of stuff in there. Check out the last videos for that. Other piece that we had, check out yesterday's video, was all about the change data feed on a Delta table. So we can turn that on, and then as we do anything that affects existing records inside a Delta table, it'll say just the things that have changed and keep them off in a separate store, a duplicate store. So we can then query those directly. So if you're trying to do kind of trickle down change feeds across multiple different Delta tables, this is an awesome and efficient way to do it. So 8.2, lots of cool stuff. That's now GA. The change data feed is still preview inside the GA release. <laughs> okay, uh, job management bits. So in the last roundup, we had the private, the public preview of the new jobs interface, essentially making it slightly easier to work with jobs. If you're going in to the Databricks workspace UI and setting up a job, they just made the forms and menus a little bit easier to create and work with jobs. That's now looks like it's gone live, so that's now in there properly. Okay, so cluster policy changes. So previously, if you had a cluster policy saying, you know, people are only allowed to they had to have certain tags. They are only allowed a certain size of cluster, only so many workers. Whatever policies you are applying to your clusters, it wouldn't apply to existing clusters. You had to have to kind of recreate them. It wouldn't quite work effectively. Or you'd have to edit cluster and tell it to be applied to an existing policy. So they've now changed it. So you can apply cluster policies to existing clusters. And that means that anytime when they restart or when they edit that cluster, it'll then inherit the new policy and it won't be able to restart until it adheres to that policy. So essentially, the moment they turn it off, they can't turn it back on unless it is adhering to whatever new policy that you've put in place. So if you're allowing your teams to do their own cluster creation, to do their own manipulation and kind of design the clusters and spin them up as and when they need it, if they're empowered to do that, you can still have that grain of control by using cluster policies on top of it. So very good idea. Okay, so one of the other pieces that we had last month was if you are calling the jobs API, you'd get a little parameter back telling how many times I had to retry. Um, they've actually put something in now. So actually you can use that retry attempt within your actual jobs. So now kind of there's a bunch of parameters that you have access to. If you are going in and you're doing anything inside a job, you can have that job pass parameters into the notebook or the submit or whatever it's actually doing, pushing that stuff in. So actually your notebooks as it's running will be aware of how many times it's had to retry to get here. So I can say, well, if this is the second attempt, try something else. If this is the 10th attempt, why are we still here? Uh, but essentially you can, you can keep it in your logging. You can track that as part of uh, any log output that you're doing. You can do logic pass depending on the number of retries. Just gives you access to that information, that extra bit of context to make your jobs a little bit smarter. So really cool. Okay. So I'm um, viewing cluster details when you create a new cluster. I didn't think this was new, <laughs> but when you're going in and you're creating a cluster, so we go over here and we go into clusters and we create a new cluster. 
it's all this stuff so it's actually giving us that context of when we're going in we're creating that amount and we're kind of deciding what we want our cluster to look like and change around change some things it's good context of what's actually happening a little bit better labeling essentially telling us when we're creating a cluster what's going on now i'm pretty sure that's been in there forever um but apparently apparently that's an update mm. Maybe I'm just going crazy. <laughs> um, so there's some ML flow, ML flow changes. Um, so if you're doing multiple, tracking multiple experiments, you want to actually see what the experiments runs were. It wouldn't always show you which uh, experiment you're on. You'd have to kind of change it around. Um, so now it'll actually show you the most recent experiment you logged into. So you can actually go and get that. It gives you a bit more context if you're using ML flow heavily. Um, you've also got some changes to the default uh, kind of YAML. So previously it used to go into a channel called defaults. Now I'm going to change over into a default one called Conda Forge. And that's not a thing that you have to change. It's now just going to change for you. So be aware if you're expecting it to be in the defaults channel and you go in and start using it from the new version of the platform, then you're going to get it in a different place. Now, again, not a data scientist. That's not an area I use heavily, um, but I'd watch out for it because you're expecting it to be in a certain place. It's going to be in a different place now. So be aware. Okay, um, we have improved the uh, Tableau Online connector. So again, we've seen that kind of a lot with the push for SQL Analytics. We've seen the new version of the Power BI connector, we've seen this new version of the Tableau connector. That is now GA, so you can go and use, connect to Azure Databricks from Tableau Online, and it'll use Azure Active Authentication. You no longer have to get your BI users to generate a personal access token and have this token thing. They can just sign in using their Active Directory authenticate nicely and it will go in and be a much more seamless way of working with the data works especially nicely if you're using it with table access control so you've actually said well this user this group of users can see these databases this different group can see these different databases because they are authenticating as themselves via aad then they can actually go and just see the tables they should have access to and it's just a much more joined up way of working so awesome very 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 good um, again, we saw the, I should probably go the other way up uh, in terms of things. We saw Runtime 8.2 in beta and released within this month. And uh, this is an important one. So if you are doing any networking around how you're connecting Databricks to your internal networks, um, so because you've got all these um, worker machines creating inside your cluster, um, you normally need to create some kind of routing table, some kind of way of actually getting from their IP addresses to your internal IP addresses and that goes inside your internal network. Now these clusters also need to be able to talk to actually, you know, the control plane. The, when you log into the Databricks workspace and you type something into a notebook, that is your Azure control plane that needs to be able to talk to that cluster. So there are some changes actually to um, how they're doing that networking. Meaning if you've already built in the networking all around your existing clusters and you've put in some custom routing tables, you've put in a, a custom egress firewall to specify how those clusters can talk to the control plane and talk to your network, you might have to update it, you might have to change it because uh, they're changing the IP addresses, and they're changing around how some of that works. So definitely recommend checking that out if you currently do that uh, for your existing architecture. Of the bits and pieces, so user limits. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware what the user limits was before, but you can now have up to 10,000 users in a Databricks workspace and they can be sorted into 5,000 groups. So that, again, is 10,000 Active Directory users, but 5,000 Databricks groups. You cannot still add an Active Directory group to a Databricks workspace. If you've got 10,000 users in your uh, workspace, that's that's probably quite a lot. Um, certainly, it's way more than uh, we've come across. People normally, people tend to split out their workspaces if you do that. But then you have to have like different copies of your Hive tables and metadata and all that kind of stuff. So as people have moved more towards lake house type thing, they've tried to say, this is essentially my enterprise data model that I'm serving through things like Databricks. It kind of makes sense that you're starting to get these workspaces, which become a bigger, heavier central hub for lots of different people trying to run queries against it. So we've now got the ability to expose that to far more people. Okay, so the jobs run page now refreshes every five seconds. Just nice, stops you hammering the refresh button. All good. Um, changes to model serving clusters. So if you're using MLflow to serve models 
essentially you've built a model, you've put it into the model registry and you say, can you please provide me a, um, a REST API endpoint so I can send messages, score it using that model and send a response. If you set that up and you actually sort of turn on serving on one of your models, what that does behind the scenes, it spins up a really basic Databricks cluster that it uses to actually host that model and serve those responses. Now, previously, if you set up a load of global init scripts, that might actually do some stuff which doesn't fit with the how they're actually trying to manage those essentially black box hidden managed clusters behind the scenes. So they've made a change. If you now have some global init scripts, they will not run on the model serving clusters. So if there's something weird with your model where you have to have something with an init script, as it says, you'll need to get hold of Databricks and say, actually, could you could you make that happen in my workspace? Um, for most people, from what we've seen, that should be a no-brainer. It just makes sense that you don't need to do that stuff because those clusters are so boilerplate, bog standard. There's no change in there. It's just to host a model and provide a web service endpoint. So again, be aware if that's not something you're currently expecting. Uh, another one, if you are the owner of a model, so if you've registered a model in the registry and someone changes it and actually writes a new version or they change the status of it or they promote it, whereas you only had it in staging, you've now got the ability to say, hey, can you just email me? If someone if someone does something with my model, can you tell me about it? Um, so that could be someone training a new version of your model or completely replacing it with their own approach to achieve the same business objective. Lots of different uh, reasons why someone might change something in the registry, but just you can now turn on notifications and then you get a little email to say, someone's changed a model that you are currently responsible for. So you can go and have a play with that and all the various notifications in there. And finally, final bit of news is if you were using Databricks Runtime 6.4, if you hadn't yet moved onto the Runtime 7 series, support has now ended for Databricks Runtime 6.4. Now they had that as a, a big long time um, extended support. It is still running extended support to the end of 2021. They delayed putting off, uh, I think the 7.4, I believe is the, the standard in the kind of uh, the seven runtime series. And that didn't quite come out as LTS for quite some time. So I think they put in extended support for 6.4 to kind of cover it until the end. Realistically, now you really should be on uh, the seven series. And from what we've seen, there's little reason not to be on the 8.0.8x uh, runtime. The main things to be aware of, there were a few things moving from the six to seven in terms of uh, if you're using date formatting. So anything that was expecting, you know, the, the whole um, switch to the Gregorian date formats. So the case that you're using for YYYY, MM, DD, you'd have to play with that kind of stuff a little bit. Uh, and obviously the libraries that are installed on there. So if you're using any of the backend libraries that are installed by default on a cluster, you might have some things to check and test when you upgrade. If you're just using standard Spark code, that's the date um, compatibility, the only thing that we came across. Moving up to runtime eight, really the only thing that we've found is that the, um, the default format for any tables created. So if you say just data frame dot write or create table and uh, give it some data, um, from 8.0 onwards, it will create that as a Delta table automatically. Now, if you're creating your tables and you're not putting in a format, then that's just kind of lazy and it's your own fault. So <laughs> check your code, make sure you're actually specifying the format of any tables. And then there's probably little reason, at least not to spin up a cluster and test your existing code in the later runtimes. Completely get lots of organizations. They can't have an evolving runtime. They have to get a formal sign up for the runtime they're using, very, very kind of formal path to production notes. It makes sense. But if you are still on 6.4, you should probably be thinking about how you move up and what that upgrade path looks like given we're now past formal support and we're into extended support. Cool. So that is our platform release notes for April. So a whole mix of stuff, some extensions, some little bits of extra functionality. Um, again, majorly the runtime uh, upgrades of actually the Databricks engine is the bits that we're interested in. There's one bit actually we didn't get to having a look at last time because my uh, platform hadn't been rolled out with it. And that is, of course, we can now do the joy that is dark mode. So you do have this little button that we can go to like your format. So how are you actually looking at it? And you've now got notebook theme. So we can switch over to dark mode. But annoyingly, that's not great for doing talks. So I'm gonna have to stick with light mode for whenever I'm filming videos, otherwise I'll forget. And I'll get a load of complaints down in the comments going, ah, oh, dark mode, we can't read it. So fine, I'll stick with light mode. 
you guys want it, you do have dark mode there. Generally a slightly more comfortable development environment if you are staring at your screen for a long, long, long time. Uh, and obviously we all just stare lovingly at Databricks Notebooks all day. So that is now in there. And that was rolling out during the last week of March. So everyone should have, uh, now have that. So you should see that available for you to work with. Cool, right, okay, that is my big old roundup of all the stuff that is happening in Dataverse currently. Again, as I said, if there's anything in there that you think actually bears a deeper look at, you're like, oh no, the, the switch with the Conda, that's actually got a lot more than just changing the default location. This is why you should look into it. Let me know down in the comments and I'll do some digging. But otherwise, hope you all have a fantastic time. Let us know if there's any things that we should look into in the future. Otherwise, have a good one.